Welcome back to the Relentless Minds podcast. I am your host, Lori Jimenez. I created this platform with a sole mission, and that is to inspire people of all backgrounds to create the change they wish to see in their lives and in the world by sharing the examples of those who are. As a listener, you will hear the stories of ordinary men and women with extraordinary stories of overcoming adversities in order to experience the life they dream of. All of these individuals share a common interest. They desire a change for the better, and they are in a relentless pursuit to create that for themselves. If you're looking for inspiration to overcome challenges in your own life, to create a life that you desire to have, then you have come to the right place. You see, the truth is, people everywhere are fighting for what they believe in, and together, with relentless action and mental strength, I have no doubt that we can fulfill that dream. In this episode, I interview Jean Celestine Lakin, the founder of One Million Orphans, a nonprofit with the mission to help orphans around the world to receive resources they lack and a shot at a better future. She is also the author of the book A Voice in the Darkness, memoir of a Rwandan genocide survivor. Jean is also a wife and mother of a beautiful and sweet three year old boy named Samuel. Jean's story of survival and resilience is a unique one because when the genocide of the Tutsis ended in July of 1994, her struggles and abuse did not. Jean was nine years old when the genocide in Rwanda occurred, and for the following nine years, she would endure betrayal and abuse at the hands of those that she came to trust. From enduring rape at the age of nine, from a much older Hutu man who was guilty of murdering Tutsis and held her captive, to seeing her parents and three-week-old brother murdered, and then falling into the foster care system, where she continued to experience abuse, Jean's story is nothing short of unbelievable. Jean covers her experiences in detail in her book, and in this interview, we discuss her journey to escaping to a better future and the drive that kept her going. Let's start the conversation. Hi, Jean. Thank you so much for joining us today on Relentless Minds to share with us your incredible story of resilience and survival as a survivor of the genocide that occurred in Rwanda in 1994, and also surviving the hardships and realities of the foster care system in which you endured abuse for years to follow. I'm also looking forward to talking about the heartwarming organization you founded called One Million Orphans, which aims to help orphans around the world to receive resources they lack and a shot at a better future. Thank you so much, Lori. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, it is just it's such an, you know, a great opportunity to be able to share, to be with you this morning. So I'm very grateful that we are here. We're going to uh, you know, unpack a lot, uh, mm-hmm. but I'm excited. Awesome. Thank you. And so most of your story and what we'll cover today from it can be found in your book, A Voice in the Darkness, Memoir of a Rwandan Genocide Survivor. Honestly, the way that you described your experience truly helped me to feel as if I was there with you in your journey of survival. And really, John, it was an incredible book. I appreciate it. Thank you. You know, one of the things that I I, I avoid, in, you know, kind of talking about people ask me, like, how long did it take you? Mm. Because it, it, it's just uh, the story itself. Uh, and it was, you know, between me and my husband writing, you know, the story, of course. Uh, and sometimes you, I, I'll, I'll write. And then I'll hand over him the, uh, you know, the manuscript and he'll look over it and he was afraid of touching the story, of even like editing, because he felt like the story was so personal to me. But he will have, uh, he will go through interview styles where he will ask me, so what was the weather like in this place where you were hiding? What, what were you eating? What were you doing? What were you feeling? Those things like, you know, when you're thinking about your personal story, you leave out. But those are very important to yes. somebody else reading and walk, going and walking with you as they read the story. So thank mm-hmm. you for mentioning, mentioning that. There you go. It was very important because I was able to go into every single experience with you. And so to start off, I'd like to highlight your book and the title. How did you come up with the title of your book? A Voice in the Darkness. A Voice in the Darkness. Oh my goodness, Lori. So we went through so many titles. <laughs> I have so many lists for the, uh, just for the title. And, you know, one one of, there was, uh, I was just walking on this day and I don't know why, I, I just got out of, uh, it was a university in Austin. And as I was walking out, I was listening to this woman who was talking about people who have been abused. 
you know, in herself being abused and never really talked about that experience until later on and felt like, you know, ashamed and judged. And, uh, and so I felt like uh, a voice in the darkness had two, almost like two meaning, like being that for me, once you survive something like, you know, what I survived, a lot of people go, you could actually shut down. Don't feel like your your experience is worth listening to, or there's a shame that is attached to that as well. Uh, a lot of people think like you are what happened to you, and that's never true. Uh, and so, a voice in the darkness was really to empower other people who have gone through horrific experience, who have gone through trauma, to be able to speak of those events. And the other piece about you know a voice in the darkness, it's just when I I went through the genocide because so much that happened, I mean, so much happened. Mm. I felt as if I was silenced at some point by the genocide. And so I felt like that voice, like it's almost like a, no matter how much I would try to explain, nobody would understand mm-hmm. the magnitude of the genocide. And so with that, I was like, okay, but that voice somehow has to come out. Yeah. And once I started speaking in, you know, being in a place like this with you, it, it's really like uh, it goes with the title. You're giving me that place and, you know, the platform to be able to bring out that voice that was silenced for so many years, mm-hmm. whether it was just the genocide, whether it was to be the abuse. So that's how the title really came about. And I, I, I said at one point, I was like, this is it. We're sticking to this. <laughs> Oh my goodness. It's an incredible title. It really speaks to that oppression and that position that a lot of people might feel where they're not being seen, they're not being heard. Now, when it comes to your story, because this is where we're going to start off. And there is just like you said, so much, so much that happened during your time in the genocide and then afterwards as well. And where I'd like to start off with your story was you know, you were nine years old when these events transpired. And on the day of the first day of the genocide, your father had decided to separate the siblings, right? In order to increase chances for survival. And you were placed with your two younger twin sisters who were three years old. So you were nine, they were three. And there were nine siblings as well, 10 siblings as well, total, right? And so you're thinking you've got groups of of three, 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 and then your parents, and then your three-week-old baby brother. Mm -hmm. But you were with your sisters, and you were tasked with the responsibility of staying alive and protecting your baby twin sisters. What were some of the key events where you had to be innovative and proactive in order to survive? And when it comes to this, I'm talking about your ways of escaping you know, if you could talk about these experiences, because there's so much to cover, but these, there were some highlighted experiences there where you were able to survive that just amazed me. Thank you. So one of the, uh, it really like, you know, so now I have like a three-year-old little boy and mm. I look at him and, and go, oh my gosh, he was the same age as, you know, my twin sisters at that time. And uh, I, I tend to think like how spoiled, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know he is um because like you're really like trying to explain to a three-year-old the the genocide or what is happening around them it was one of the things that i, I couldn't even there was no word for it mm-hmm. as a nine-year-old myself i was like there's no way uh i didn't under fully understand that the so much hate will go in somebody's mind and somebody's heart mm-hmm. to go after another human being and literally butcher them with the machetes and clubs. And so when I was in the bushes hiding with the twins, one of the things that, you know, many things I did really like it was to implement games uh, mm-hmm. because I was like, if I can keep them quiet uh, and also entertained, <laughs> yes. It will keep us like at least like you know, and also take our mind off what was happening around us. And so, really playing those uh, games in the dirt with little sticks, and then having to insert seeds, these like little round marble seeds in our nose to really like sort of like a camouflage, basically what was favored of the Hutu's nose, broader nose, and to give us a chance to be out in the open was one of the things I, you know, had to do with the twins. And also just keep, you know, they they helped me so much, Lori, that I cannot even put into words. And I, I, I get choked up every time I start speaking about how they helped me because like 
there were moments where the genocide was getting to just so heavy to my heart. I, I was watching dead people all over the place. But with the twins, they really brought me back to the focus being them. There was a moment where I felt like I just wanted my life to, I wanted to walk straight to the these people with machetes to end my life. But then I'll look into these uh, their eyes and go, there's no way I can, you know, uh, and you read in the book to even a place where I was just about to drown with them. Mm-hmm. And I yes. looked in their eyes and I was like, there's no way I will forgive myself. Uh, there's no way my parents will forgive me for committing such, you know, uh, committing suicide. But it was because it was just getting so heavy to the point I felt like, you know, and a lot of people, they think I was this courageous person. It was just like day by day Stay trying busy. to figure out how to, um, you know, people say terrible twos. But I say at that time, I was like, terrible threes. Yeah. <laughs> they had so many questions for me that mm. I couldn't answer for them. I want to go see my mommy. I want to go see my daddy. I want to go sleep in my bed. Mm. And um, But they really gave me a sense of of hope. They gave me, you know, it sort of like stopped focusing on myself and focused on their survival. Yeah. And that was my drive. To even see the, the light at the end of the tunnel, it was they were right there with me. And at the beginning, when my parents gave them to me, I was like, oh boy. And I didn't really understand how the genocide was going to unfold until we were right in it. Yeah. But then I was like, boy, how do you keep a three-year-old, two of them, alive in this madness, you know? But really, God kept us safe, you know, and again, I'm not that as courageous as most people, you know, think, but I felt like I was given this strength as I was going through it. As you were going through it, because, you know, what you'll find in the book as you read is that there were many times where you were at a divide, you were in a fork in a road where it was one decision or another, and it was a moment of strength that made you take that right decision and it ended up in your favor. Not that that happened for many, many people, but in I, your circumstance in that time, it did. And yes. it was the difference between life and death. I saw many times in your book as I was reading it. And, you know, the way that you were able to survive and like playing the games and being proactive, innovative, and you were saying you became skilled at finding the right places to hide and to create like a little, a little space for you guys to stay in the shrubbery and the, the forest. And another part of your highlights here with your story was one of the hardest experiences that no one should ever have to go through, especially at such a young age, which was seeing both of your parents dead. So can you recall the way that you had to experience this? You know, one of my uncle came in and told me that he's seen my mother's dead body. In that moment, I felt like, oh my gosh, it's like my life was shattered right in front of me like I I was like oh gosh I was with my family with my mom just a few days ago now you tell me like she's dead and the little baby brother the three week old Mm -hmm. it could be alive on her back and so and there's something where when you're going through at least for me as I was going through this like trauma of hearing like my mother's dead or even when I witnessed my father being killed it's sort of like I didn't have a room and space to grieve and so I felt like I was I had to continue to survive and so there's two parts to surviving there's one when you're going through that experience of of pain and trauma there's also the aftermath and in a lot of people in Rwanda experience the the tough part of the aftermath of uh, survival and so for me as I was going through the genocide, I felt like it was go, 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 trying to find it like, you know, you know, the next meal, which was, you know, basically nice grass, uh, little seeds, uh, mm. berries and uh, flowers and things for my siblings. But then after the genocide, I really, it was as if like I was captured into this just dark place. And I was really experiencing the full force of like PTSD, like right after the genocide. Uh, and so instead of like running and trying to find, you know, a place to hide or a place for, you know, things to eat or water to drink, I was now faced with what I've seen uh, in the genocide afterwards. And so it really, 
it, it was hard to process. It was really the toughest thing to process. Like, and especially when I get back to my home, uh, and again, it's uh, the story. So it's written to like I get taken into, you know, Congo out of Rwanda to Congo, and then I get back, and I find out like you know most of my family members yes, had yes. been wiped out. Mm-hmm. The adults, most of the adults are dead until I go into, okay, now I need to figure out how to survive. And again, two parts to like the genocide, the trauma, and also survive, but also be present, be alive. And so I had to really like forgive. Mm-hmm. Forgiveness was something that I talked about a lot. Again, a lot of people think like, you know, you have to be a Christian to forgive, or you have to be of a, a Christian faith to forgive. But I think when you talk about forgiveness it really it frees the person who has been wronged the person who has gone through that pain mm-hmm. and as a child my mother used to say that because I did go through bitterness I experienced anger I experienced all of that after the genocide and so uh, when she said like you know when you don't forgive it's almost like your prayers are capped. There's like this cup above your prayers that God is not listening to you. So as a child, I seriously believed, I believed her. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it was one of the things that I am grateful that she would actually ingrained in us and also the human family. My parents were so about the human family. Uh, I remember when I was just coming back from school where we were being segregated and teachers were just like, you have to identify whether you're a Tutsi or Hutu or Tua. And as I'm asking my parents who I was, their response was, you're yeah. a child of God. Exactly. Uh, there's no Hutu, there's no Tua in the kingdom of God. And so with that sort of like belief, with that sort of like value of the human family, I felt like I need to love those, even those who committed those crimes. And so, but again, forgiveness was one of the things that allowed me to really just walk through this journey and be okay mentally. One of the things uh, Nelson Mandela says, uh, and again, I'm going to paraphrase here, is that as he was coming out of the prison, uh, after being in prison for 27 years during the apartheid, as he was walking out, he said, if I didn't forgive or let go of the bitterness, I would still be in prison. And so for me, I felt Really, I survived the genocide, but that bitterness and anger just kept me in this dark place mm-hmm. where I wasn't able to ex- experience joy. Uh, and I used to be such a silly kid. I would just go out and enjoy the sunshine and, and just do things that are just like simple things and really felt the joy. And after the genocide, I wasn't feeling all of that. But once I forgave, I experienced the freedom. And I tell people this. You know, when we ask to forgive, it's not because uh, you want to give a pass to the person who has harmed you. And sometimes we have a hard time forgiving ourselves as well. But you forgive so you can actually enjoy the freedom that is there for all of us. Mm. You know, thank you so much for sharing that. And that was that was a topic I was so excited about tapping into with you because across all media platforms that I've seen in your book so heavily, you reiterate this value of forgiveness and considering the harm that was done to you throughout this experience in your life, your young, your childhood and your young adult life, um, to be able to then sit with yourself and to say, I forgive you because, because of me, you know, and also to see that it helps you in your healing. And it is important to be able to let that go in order for you to be able to continue on moving forward. And, you know, I did want to bring up just how powerful that message is when it comes to the fact that you not only experienced, you know, the death of your family or your parents through the genocide, but also you were a victim of sexual abuse at the hands of a Hutu and also uh, had an attempt to sold into marriage at 10 years old, and then later on in the foster care system. So if you can speak about that journey with you to forgiveness. You know, during the genocide, I, I really, there was a moment where, especially after I saw my mother and my dad, I was daddy's girl. I saw my father as like just this, like, you know, strong person that my protector, somebody who were just had, you know, so much love to offer and to watch him just having people in his life just gave me this sort of like, it was like somebody just like putting a knife in my heart, like right there. Because that precious father that I had, just to watch him just helplessly just die like that. And so there was anger 
I think I said in the book, uh, not to scare people off that I was like, if I had a gun, I would have like went after mm. those people because I, I just was like, when somebody's called, you know, when, when we are born into ethnicity or race, we don't choose where we are born. You know, we don't choose the families we come from, you know, and things like that. And so to watch him, my family just dead, there was anger. But then my parents, because of their values of like, you know, forgiveness, uh, you have to like, my mother, she used to say, you know, you, you have to forgive uh, or, or else you are as a sinner, as the person who harmed you. And so I was like, okay. I could also hear almost like her voice telling me like, mm-hmm forgive them mm-hmm. and I'm like you did but I'm also like you remembering that human value to forgive them and so I started working on a journey to really forgive right at the be- you know from the beginning it's almost like I was forgiving almost like every single day mm-hmm. <laughs> you know as I was walking through this journey and it's not just my family I mean I watch innocent men women and young children just being killed and so you forgive and you forgive and you forgive and I continue to forgive. But after the genocide, I really, like when I get back into my, uh, this village and I find out that my protective, you know, family, they're all dead. My aunties and uncles and cousins, it really hit me the hardest. And that's when I was like, oh, there's no way. I want to burn these people. Just probably even have like some type of like revenge. But then I was like, no. That's not how it's supposed to be. And so I started working on forgiving. And every time there's even moments where I said, you know, I forgive them. You know, like when you just say, like, I forgive you. But it's mm-hmm. really not coming from like the deep of your heart to mm-hmm. say, I really, really deeply forgive you. Mm-hmm. And so I forgive. And then something else will just make me upset. And I go back to it's these monsters. Yes, it has to be intentional. It has to be and consistent. So, Absolutely. I, And so when I truly forgive at the end, uh, you know, uh, after the genocide, I experienced this sense of like freedom. And that's what I talk, you know, to people about is that you forgive because you want to free those people, but mainly you forgive because you want to free yourself. If something is like keeping you awake at night, you know, you think about that somebody who said the wrong, you know, the mean things to you, have done something to you over and over again, that's just it's a moment of joy that is being taken away from you. Exactly. Uh, and so forgiveness really, it gives you the freedom to live for, you know, your potential, live mm-hmm. your, your life the way it was intended. And, and again, even myself, I press charges to the foster family that, you know, brought me even here to the United States when I was sexually abused. You know, we have justice for a reason. And so just because you forgive doesn't mean you, you stop uh, pursuing justice. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because you forgive, you, don't hold, you have to hold people accountable, but you have to give yourself that space uh, where you, you're really accessing the joy that, that is meant to, to be yours. Wow. Sorry, I'm going. <laughs> wow. No, that's, that's incredible. And I'm actually curious to talk a little more about that um, experience with the foster family. But I wanted to go back because you did have a, a positive outcome when it came to um, the, towards the end of the genocide, um, after you were able to escape your abusers who had basically trafficked you into the Congo, um, and you were located at a refugee camp. And I mean, that whole story and the way that you just, just found the, the courage to run away that one night when you were on the brink of being sold into marriage at 10 years old. I mean, that's a story that I'm going to leave the listeners to up to them to, to read and find out because it's such a courageous act at such a young age. And and absolutely inspirational. But after you were able to escape that and then go back to your hometown and search for your family. And like you said, you know, you weren't able to find the protective family members and you were met with such hostility from the neighbors and there were no Tutsis about, it was just Hutu. And you were told by a neighbor, you know, go and check out the local orphanage and you went. And what, what was the outcome of that visit? Oh my gosh, Lori. So that moment of finding uh, some of my siblings uh, who, you know, survived, it really gave me a sense of, it's almost like what was dead came to life, you know. And uh, so there were times where through the genocide where I felt like, you know what, I need to really probably be realistic and mourn for them. There's a possibility they will be they could be dead, and here I have I'm holding on to the the potential that they just a little bit like a glimpse of hope that there's a possibility that 
they could be alive, but not, a, you know, it's not a hundred percent. It's not even 50%. Mm. And so to hold on to it, I was like, I don't want to be too naive. Um, and so to find them alive, it just gave me this outlook of like, you know what, now I just need to work hard. I have the reason to work hard. I have the reason to be alive. I have the reason to really push through this life, no matter how tough it gets. Because then it was when I, I get into the orphanage home, I was 10 years old. So they said, well, fortunately, we're not, <laughs> you know, the 10 year old, you know, kicked out even like some of the, you know, younger because the orphanages were just full of kids. I mean, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of orphans, hundreds of them in that orphanage home. There were so many kids in the streets uh, of where I you know, used to live who lost their parents, just like parentless, just mm-hmm. walking in the streets, surviving, fending for themselves at a very young age. And so I get out and I'm like, even that as a homeless kid, I was like, I can make it because my siblings are there. I, I need to work hard to make sure that I, I give them the life that almost like what my parents, you know, intended to give to them. That was cut mm-hmm. short, but I had these hopes and now I felt like uh, I had hopes and dreams because yeah. they were there. And I felt this, uh, it, it's so hard to describe. Uh, I just like I literally put my hands up in the air and I was like, God, I could not have been grateful because I felt like, now I needed to just be present uh, in mm-hmm. the present moment. Uh, what I've lost, that, that is gone. But now I need to focus on what I have. Oh, uh, and that was my family. Yes. Wow, and that's incredible. And, you know, at that moment, you, when you experienced that joy of being able to be, be found again with your, with your siblings, and it was, it was um, the majority of them, I, I believe the only one who had lost his life was your three-week-old baby brother Mukio, right? Yes. And you say it's so perfect. Oh yay. <laughs> but you know, you did mention something important when it came to the orphanage that they didn't have resources or room for more children because after the genocide, so many children were left without their parents or without family members able to take care of them. And so that'll that'll take us, you know, later on into the organization that you're now working on, which is very, very important. But this left you in a predicament. Now this left you as an orphan on the streets. And in this time when you were looking for support and for that that love around you, you know, the support for family life, what was the main concern regarding your future that you had at that time? You know, so in Rwanda, we having uh, a family is such an important thing that I cannot even stress. You know, when people meet you as a young person, they ask you, what, what family are you from? You know, and so almost like your existence is attached to your family, where you're from. Mm-hmm. Wow. And so to lose that sense of, uh, you know, it's not even like a clan. It's more like a belonging. Your family the belonging mm-hmm. you belong you are somebody because you come from this family mm-hmm. and so not having that I, I felt lost mm-hmm. I felt really lost and also uh, you know as a girl as 10 you know I started thinking you know I don't have the protection I don't have that shield that I used to have because before the genocide I have never been you know touched you know mm-hmm. so I was just loved on I, I was I could say even so spoiled uh, and so to be able to fend for myself it was the toughest thing uh, and also frustrating as well because I thought I was like how do you ex- expect a 10 year old to go out there and you know help themselves mm-hmm. you know I don't have enough you know education uh, and because we grew up in a family where we were taken care of my parents had all kinds of resources where, you know, we had maids at home and they took care of the, you know, things. And so when I get my first job as a 10 year old, oh my gosh, my uh, boss realized like, I don't know how to do a whole lot. I don't know how to wash clothes. I don't know how to cook. I don't know how to iron her clothes as, mm-hmm. as a 10 year old. Uh, and I guess there were many children at that age who really like, you know what, I was, I'm a quick learner. And I said, I can master these skills if you teach me. But she expected me to really come in as a 10 year old and know exactly what to do. So I was hopeless. <laughs> I was helpless there in that situation. And she really did not um, 
have mercy on me. She she didn't give me the grace. So she, I mean, she would just, you know, burn me with cigarettes. She would beat me. She would spit on my face. But then I was like, this is what it looks like. The orphanhood mentality really kicked in at that point because I was like, not only should I learn fast how to do the tasks, mm-hmm. I also need to, to learn how to like say somehow on how to protect myself. And I don't think I was a, uh, you know, street smart at all, but I felt like I needed to learn a little bit of, <laughs> of that to function uh, in this society where you're young, you're there to be almost like abused. I, I mean, the family that I made to women is exploited. That's the word, right? And so, that sense of not having my family really put put me in a position where I felt like I need to to find a, like a, a place where I needed to belong. And many orphans uh, in Rwanda after the genocide who did not have a family have a hard time really, you know, even forgiving. I mean, how do you you go through so much? They go through so much abuse from one person to the next, or the system there. There was no social workers to follow up any any person who could have like came to the orphanage and say, "I want a child. I want to take care of a child." Mm-hmm. Here you go. Anybody take him. There was no, no process. Up. There's no process. There was no follow up. There's no not even anybody to check and go, "Is this child okay?" There was no investigation. So one of the things I did here when I, I work in the foster care system here. As you know, adoption counselor, one of the things that I made sure I was screening parents to make sure that they're not pedophiles. You know, in Rwanda, there was no such system there at that time. Anyone, any uh, sexual offender, you know, person could walk in and say, We need a child. And many children died at the hand of lack of, uh, you know, system. And I really understand that. The country was turned upside down, basically. You know, imagine like over 1 million people dying in three months. That's chaos as it is. Building just like uh, bombarded with, uh, you know, grenades and, you know, scorched to the ground. Uh, it, it was like the country had to go through like a, a rebirth of mm-hmm. and rebuilding from, you know, from scratch. And so to really have uh, a system in place. It was overwhelming for everyone, uh, even orphanage homes uh, with the nuns or the, the priests who were taking care of these kids. C- people can have compassion, but it was overwhelming, you know, for them as well. And so for me, I, uh, as a child in that moment, and I was praying, Lori, I was praying to for God to find me a family that just treat me as a child. That's just like what I wanted to to feel. Because I, I missed a, a sense of like belonging. I miss yes. a sense of uh, that layer of uh, someone just like if something happens to me to even follow up and go, this was my child or this uh, child has uh, someone else, you know, in place to check on them. I didn't have that. Mm-hmm. And so after the genocide, when I was, you know, with this family, my uh, boss, where I was a maid, I mean, that woman could have ended my life and there was no... There wouldn't be me. There wouldn't have been anybody else to kind of go back and say what happened. There was no, there wouldn't have been investigation at all. Hmm. And after that event, after you were with this woman who was just looking for a house slave, basically, and she was mm-hmm. treating you with the dignity for a 10-year-old, for a child. She was expecting so much for you to take care of everybody and everything. And, um, and she was also, from what I was reading in the book, dealing with her own PTSD. She was struggling to cope. And so she was in no way fit to take care of even another child. But that wasn't your only toxic experience as a foster child. There was the follow-up experience there with the family where the father, the, the foster parent ended up sexually abusing you, right? When you were 12 years old. And, you know, I was really, really wanted to talk to you and, and understand that as you were experiencing your own trauma, you know, from the genocide, and then now the abuse of this foster parent and trying to pick yourself up, you know, they had enrolled you in school, the mother, the foster mother, she had enrolled you in school, which was very important to you. I know we can talk about that education as well. But in this time where you were 12 years old, 13 years old, just trying to pick yourself up, focus on school, what did you do to cope and press on while experiencing that trauma, the abuse of this foster father? What did you do? 
You know, that part of the, the story, it was actually uh, probably the hardest for me to experience because I, I go into, you know, so now I survived this genocide and I find my, the, the family that I prayed for, yes. and I'm like, oh my gosh, God, now I have this loving and kind family. And then the abuse happened. And I, was, I felt like another sense of like, you know, betrayer. Um, it was like, I, I felt betrayed uh, by the family. And of course, and again, I, you know, at that point I was being told, uh, and I, I don't want to give up too much of it, but I was told like, even if you tell, nobody's going to listen. They won't believe you. Uh, and so many of the people who are have been in abusive situation, they're told like, nobody's going to listen. Nobody's going to believe you. Uh, and I want to encourage our listeners uh, because when I go speak into, you know, universities and high mm-hmm. schools, yes. many people will come back to me. Uh, they feel encouraged that I spoke up. And now I'm the first person that they tell me that they're being abused either in that moment or have been abused from home. Uh, and so I want to encourage our listeners who have gone through that experience. When you tell, we are listening. And so for me, that family, I just felt uh, not only just, you know, there was like, a, I felt robbed, <laughs> yes. you know, the joy and excitement. And now that it's being taken away. So my coping mechanism became school. Mm-hmm. Like really, when I got into school, I, I felt like I could be a kid. I could be silly. I could be, I could be you know, childish, and it was okay, instead of, like, this mentality of a grown-up, because I uh, really, like, one of the things, like, I feel like the genocide did to me, I had to grow up so fast. I had to be responsible. I felt like I was wearing a hat of uh, a mom and a dad at 10. <laughs> Being in school and also having teachers who were just kind, who encouraged me, I held on to simple encouragements, you know, anybody who's a teacher on this, you know, listening to us, what you do is incredible. Mm -hmm. Uh, Your words will impact your kids in a way that is lifetime. Uh, And so to have that encouragement from teachers, from friends, it just made me feel like I I can continue to go on. But again, also I felt like because of uh, what I was told that nobody's going to believe me, I didn't share uh, about the abuse for a very long time. But I felt like I didn't even have to share. I just have to like focus on the fact that I do have the family to take care of. I need to go through the school schooling system. And also was told, if you tell, uh, but by the way, it could be in the streets. And then I was imagining myself being even abused the worst. And also, I want to encourage the parents who are you know on your platform, you who are listening to us to really the words that they say to their children is so powerful if they're positive words um i remember you know when i was you know abused and i was told like oh you're so disgusting you're very ugly you you're stupid and things like that but then i held on to what my parents used to tell me you're beautiful you're kind you're smart and i'll go as i was being told all these things because that basically that was to destroy my self esteem i held on to what my parents told me and i thought you know what that 9 years of my life was so important that i felt like it's almost like they equipped me to be the person almost to face the child you know to really like a I mean, nobody can give you the tools to go through the genocide, but it gave me that confidence of who I was. And so there was no confusion of who I was. I I knew myself. uh, I knew what I was capable. But that reassurance of like, you are smart, you are beautiful, because a lot of abusers usually like they really destroy your self-esteem. So that way you feel like you depend, you can depend on them or you cannot leave that situation because out there it could be worse. Wow. That's yeah. such a powerful message. Would you say then, because of, because absolutely, um, I second that, that what your parents tell you, what the people closest to you tell you is very, very important. And so would you say that your ability to still maintain your level of self-worth stemmed from the encouragement and support and the backing that your parents had initially instilled in you? Absolutely. We, if I didn't have that, I think I would have uh, turned, um, after the genocide, I think my sense of uh, worth would have been, 
probably be in a cage right now, just, uh, you know, or under the bridge someplace because uh, in the genocide, we were the cockroaches, we were the snakes. And so even that to equate you to an animal, mm -hmm. uh, it destroys the sense of being, of human being. We used to have moments, um, and I talk about this in the book and it puts a smile on my face because I think it's like a very important we used to sit at the table at the end of uh, our meal and we just share the positive things that happen in our day and the negative things that happen in our day. And that was a way for us to really unload and also encourage one another. And so it, it gave me, those moments gave me a sense of like the reassurance of who I really am as a child. Mm -hmm. uh, the reminder of not just like smart and, and beautiful and capable these values but also gave me like a place in the world if that makes sense to feel like i i exist but also exist in a space that where god wants me to be here i need to be here i need to enjoy those you know moments of what he created for me there's beauty in all of us you know there's just goodness in us. Uh, when I was being told otherwise, I'll go back to what my parents used to say, the human family, to see good in people, to see good in others, uh, because that really brings a sense of the center of, of love, which makes you feel like, you know what, I'm worthy of being here. I, this space that I'm claiming, I'm supposed to be here. Instead of, uh, you know, because a lot of uh, time I felt like, uh, even after the genocide, many people committed genocide because they felt like now, you know, they lost their families. Now they don't have a place to belong. Uh, but my parents really ingrained in me the worth of me as a human being. Uh, and that was very, very, very important. And again, parents who are listening, your words would impact your children for a lifetime. I tell my little boy how cute he is because he's really super cute, uh, mm -hmm. but also how he smart is. and kind. And I mean, we get thousands of hugs a day, which is just you know so precious. But I want to make sure that he understands that he's loved, uh, because you know um, there's a saying that when you know the outside, whatever the negative information that comes from outside, it is not as harmful as what's in, in our hearts and in our internal inside. And so my my core felt like I had been fed and strengthened before the genocide. And so all the other noises that was coming from outside telling me that I was ugly, I was dumb and, and so forth. I was like, no, I've been told as otherwise by the people that I trust the most. Exactly. Because of my parents. Yes. And the fact that you didn't have your parents anymore there to continue to say these words, I think they held on with that impact, those final words that you were able to hold on to. And, right. and the strength that you showed, you know, with each chapter in your life is absolutely astounding because you endured the, the abuse of this foster family, the foster father for years until you were 18 years old and finally able to make your escape. And you made an, a life altering decision uh, to escape this family. And you had decided to attend university at the same time. That was your, your, your method of escape. Right. Um, how did, how did you go about, accomplishing this because this story I mean for me I mean the fact that you're again innovative and took initiative when it came to making your money um, and getting and getting your transportation out to the to Washington state um, I think that's an incredible part of your life where it was like you're flipping the page you're saying this is now me taking control you're 18 years old and you are making this decision for your, your future and for the future of your siblings. So can you tell us about this transition in your life where you were empowered to make that next life choice? You know, so uh, that's a very uh, sweet question. And it's so loaded with like, I feel like my head is like, oh, there's so many answers to this one. Uh, I felt like, you know, I wanted to run away from the beginning uh, from this family. But then I was like, I didn't have, you know, when you, when I was around that, you know, in Missouri, I didn't have that one person that I can actually come to and tell them what was happening to me uh, for even like, for guidance or so people assumed it, but also they wanted me to run away and go to like, a different country or, um, but I, I felt like, you know what, I made the decision that I would actually escape and finally go to 
go to college. Um, you know, as you read in the book, uh, first mom, of course, she was like, you know, you have, you know, stay close by because of course I was taking care of everything else. But, um, I knew I needed to have that freedom to where I can actually get a job and work and be independent and also come out and give back because I was given so much, uh, God has given me so many passes in life, but I also wanted to give back to the people that I, you know, care so much about. And so when, once I got to Washington State, uh, it, it just, it was uh, liberating. I felt this freedom of just being able to have access to, to do. I uh, felt like an adult then, and I felt like I, I can ask questions and, you know, to grow. Uh, I wanted to work so hard to get my bachelor's degree. Uh, and then I was like, you know what, now a bachelor's degree, so it's, uh, we might as well just go ahead for a master's degree. But it was really that moving piece of like, I didn't want to look at myself, just myself. I was looking at a community to where I, I give back, but also to I like, give the future to my siblings as well that I felt like they deserve. The future that I worked for, you know, uh, and people who read the book, they, they realize that I worked for three bucks, uh, you know, a month. <laughs> and now I wanted to go on to be able to make a little bit more yes. so I can actually give them that, you know, you know, I mean, I paid for their education. I paid for their their meals and all their basics, rent, you name it. And then they started calling me mommy, which was like, okay, come on now. <laughs> How old were you when they were calling you mom? Oh my goodness, Lori, the minute I started, uh, um, the girls were really like, uh, after we, they knew like mom and dad are dead, I was mom. Uh, and then I was like, oh, goodness. So now I'm a 10-year-old, mommy 10-year-old. Um, but my siblings really started calling me mom when I was probably like around like 12, 14. So I kind of got used to playing that role. Um, mm-hmm. They also have a nickname for me, uh, which I shouldn't share, but uh, they called me the, the police because I was like, really like more kind of like very straightforward. Like, okay, I want to make sure that they succeed. I want to make sure that they go to school. Mm. I want to make sure that they're really not wasting their, you know, because of what, you know, their past. I didn't want, you know, their past to determine what their future is going to look yes. like, uh, to go in just like, you know, with bitterness, to go in just feeling sorry for themselves. And, and, and that's something that, you know, it's a message that I, I share with a lot of people is that perseverance is very, very important to be courageous, to be able to look at your life despite what happened to you, to find a light at the end of the tunnel. Because I feel like for me, at least uh, when I went to uh, Washington State, I was like, I'm going to push through this, an assignment that would have taken me, you know, anybody else, maybe like a few minutes it took me hours uh and that kind of reminds me of something einstein says it, it's not because he was so smart but it's because he stayed with the problem longer and mm-hmm. that applies to all of us and so i was like okay there goes a uh, chemistry class how do i go through this with my little french dictionary uh how do i just like continue to power through this to achieve my goals and that's really what I did mm-hmm. uh, and again it's not because I'm you know super smart here uh, I got some some good brains thank god you definitely I, do uh, <laughs> and I think that you definitely do have have the, the brains but you also have just that initiative and that drive to get through things and like you said the perseverance and I think it's I just wanted to mention that um, at this point you know we're talking about you um, when you're completing high school and when you moved to Washington State. So you were obviously in the U.S. at this time. So you, you came to the U.S. You were, I think you were saying you were 14, yes, right? When so you great. came to the U.S. And so you left your siblings, you know, but you came here with the hopes of having a better future, right? And being able to provide for them. And you were working very, very, very hard because now I understand you had this, you were in a position you felt of, parenting, right? And your mother responsibilities. And um, there was, I wanted to bring up this card that your sister, Teta, Teta, yes, sent you, in which she ended with saying that everyone is counting on you to help us have a better future. So she sent that to you from Rwanda. You were in the U.S. What did this mean to you? And how did it impact your life and mentality throughout your fight for a better future for all of you? Oh my goodness, that card put me in, in a lot of tears. 
Mm. I was like, yeah, you know, I can't forget that they really are counting on me. There was always this pressure that I'm working to the future, not just for me, but for them and, and to be able to give back to to build a better future for others, those who have gone through maybe either similar experience or different circumstances in, in the world. My purpose of surviving had so much more to it than just like surviving, right? And so I, uh, when I saw the card, I just felt this, uh, I was like, wow, they really, really do count on me for their future. Like if I don't make it, they can't or they can make it, but it's going to be, you know, such a struggle. Uh, in, in Rwanda at that time, they had systems where to go to school, you had to pay, uh, even elementary school, elementary to uh, high school by, mm-hmm. at that time. Now the system's so much better. And so I was like, okay, I need to put them through, you know, school. And I told them, you know, I told my siblings that, look, I will not have an investment to where your or inheritance where I'm giving you a home or giving you a land or something, but I'm going to invest in you in education because education was like one of the things that was so important to me, also to my parents. Uh, They really spent, um, they ensured us that education was a way to have the voice, uh, even at the very early age, that you go through the school to have to be to sit at the table and discuss issues that matter to you. Once you have your education, you're able to advocate for groups of people that uh, you care so much for or have that voice uh, and have that platform. So I told my siblings that I will invest in your education. And I made sure that, you know, the young ones, uh, especially the young ones, my my twin sister, not not so much. She was, I think because of the trauma and PTSD that she experienced, it was almost like in and out with school, but the rest of them, they graduated. Uh, Some have bachelors and others with masters and other, you know, just continue. Uh, But I really felt once I left, once I, I got that card was like a reminder of what I worry like that to myself to do, but even more. Uh, so I still have a, a copy of that, which is like, you know, every time I look at it, it gets old and old. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so important because it really serves to drive your purpose, you know, and it reminds you of, of who's counting on you. And it, it's a great driving force because you were dealing with some crazy challenges. And, and throughout your whole journey from, from the looks of it, I mean, it was your family. It was those that you felt were counting on you that really kept you going, you yeah. know? You know, one of the things I tend to tell people is that even if your life is not working the way you expect it to be, reach out to those who are less fortunate. There's power in that. There's power when you go out and help somebody else mm-hmm. who you think is an, is not in position to go or to have access to the needs that they, they have. And so for me, when I give back, for me, when I do something for somebody else, uh, and it could be, you know, simple, it could be small things, especially now that we're going through this coronavirus outbreak. I think, it, you know, if you look at yourself and you're being quarantined in the house and life is, you know, miserable in your home, we need to think outside of the box. So like, what about the other people who not only like you're quarantined, but might not have the meals, food in their homes. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about those people who are quarantined, you know, in orphanage homes, like these yes. kids that we talk about? Uh, what about the elderly in a nursing home? So when I think of my life and when things are not going well, uh, I encourage people to think of the less fortunate that we have in our society because that gives you a sense of gratitude uh, of what you have, simple things, and a sense of uh, appreciation of where you are in life. And also really uh, encourage people to do simple things for others because that brings joy. That gives you a sense of living uh, mm-hmm. this life as well. So, Absolutely. And I see that you do that in in many facets of your life. And you were doing that when you were in university. And so I really commend you for the work that you do in order to uplift and empower other people. And that brings me to my question of when was it that you recognized and reaffirmed that you had to be a voice for those who were silenced by the genocide? You know, so Lori, when I started off, um, I started speaking when I was in high school. Oh my goodness. And that was just, um, I couldn't really like stand and speak of, 
the experience because again i was just like those people that i i get to meet who who are genocide survivors who tell me like how do you stand there and really share what happened um in in rwanda without breaking down in in pieces or just like really really losing it and so i felt like for me um and again in high school i would just like i would start and then i would stop but the more i was telling people whether it was like a teacher, whether it was like a auntie and uncle that you know, I met in Washington State, whom I love. Um, when I saw how they, you know, they were drawn in to listen to the story or also just wanting me to just like be me and share what was, in, you know, in my heart, it gave me encouragement to speak. But really, like, I mean, I was speaking at Dallas Holocaust Museum there and I was just driving with somebody who drives the Holocaust survivors. And he said, they're now in their 90s. They're very, very few. And now he has like three groups of people, just three people that he's driving to speak about the Holocaust. And so I felt like a sense of responsibility way back then because I saw myself I mean, eventually I'm going to get old and, and I won't be able to talk about these events. But if I don't speak about these events now, who else will, you know? Uh, and so from the high school, when I was even in high school, uh, when I got to university, I was even given even more opportunities uh, to just like share different events, to share what happened in Rwanda. But one of the things that I, I think it's uh, not just a responsibility uh, for us to really share what happened, I think it's uh, important for survivors to give the voice to those who their voice were taken away so early. And when I speak, I'm not just speaking about my family, I'm speaking for all those innocent one million people that we lost in the genocide. At the beginning, it was tough, uh, but, you know, I went into, of course, counseling, and then I did EMDR, uh, which was really helpful to be able to, to share. Uh, and there's a stigma where for Africans to speak, to, to go for counseling, it's almost like a, not something that is in, in, very much encouraged. Uh, but also when somebody has, even here in our beautiful country here, when people go through abuse, there's a, a stigma to talk to somebody about those abuse. It's almost like people prefer to like, you know, obviously swipe it on, you know, under the carpet and somehow expect it to go away, but it really comes back. And so when I started speaking to counselors and also with this EMDR, I felt like a, a sense of really like be able to slowly be able to release and really understand the abuse on a level that was digestible, if that makes any sense, uh, in a way that it's not overwhelming in my mind that I could actually share with others. Um, I remember when um, I finished the book, my uncle, it was sitting on my, uh, I had the, the manuscript sitting there, uh, Lori, just feeling like, oh my goodness, the world is going to know who I am and they're going to judge me, they're going to criticize me. And I, as I was speaking to this uncle, he said, you know what, Jean, this is not about you. Mm. This book is about somebody else who's going to read it and change their perception of the world, or change the perception of themselves, change how they, they view themselves. And so with that insight, that wisdom of our story could be the key that opens somebody else's gate, you know, or yes. somebody's prison. Uh, and so sharing really became something that I felt like, you know what, if I have an ear that listens, why not? And let people know about the genocide because it happens, you know, in the 20th century, but it's a genocide that was really much not known by many people. Mm-hmm. And so I have been, you know, it's a privilege for me to be able to, to share and educate our young people and encourage them that, you know, we all go through life. Everybody has a story. And, you know, when you have a story, every story is worth listening to. Every story could be that key that really gives somebody else a way to live or get out of the, their uh, horrible situation. So sharing has been really for me. And as I go into like high schools and universities, I see kids who really come up to me and go, oh my gosh, I am going through the same thing Mm -hmm. that you've gone through. Or I experienced this, now you give me 
you empowered me to speak about what happened to me. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents were, you know, drug addict. Uh, this is what they did to me. Or I am facing anxiety and I'm experiencing, you know, I have PTSD, but I don't know who to speak to. And I connect to them and I, and I think I need to do a better job in terms of, um, you know, because I, I'm, for the first time, kids are telling me or young people are telling me, uh, disclosing things that I have, they have never shared with anyone else. And I need to learn how to really advocate for them uh, because they trust the fact that I can speak about them. They trust to tell me yeah. uh, instead of telling anybody else. When I share, I feel like it's a sense of responsibility to give somebody else that voice that they need. Exactly. Uh, if they can listen to my story and be able to see either, and I, I say this, when people read my book and go, oh my gosh, I cannot even compare myself to you. Every person is affected differently mm -hmm. by the things that they've gone through. It's a matter of how they go through this journey, how they process. It could be something that we think is small, but to that person, it's a major thing. It's a magnitude. It's a life change uh, experience. And so I, I just, my hope is to to share and give everybody else uh, a way to process and have joy in, in this life, right? Absolutely. Yes. And your book does an incredible job. I mean, the fact that you decided to take that next step and not just stick to the public speaking and sharing on media, because it reflects so much your emotion, what was going on in your head, the details of your experience. And that is what people connect with. The fact that you were able to be so vulnerable and so open about your experience, it really allows people the space to connect with that and say that this is okay. Say if she was able to have that strength and and that respect for herself to be open and share this this moment, it's okay for me to do so as well. And I think that's an important message. And so again, your book called A Voice in the Darkness, Memoir of a Rwandan Genocide Survivor. I'm gonna make sure to include the link in the show notes um, for this episode so that people can access your book. And I wanted to mention before we move on to the next part, which is your organization, but the proceed, part of the proceeds from the purchase of the book also go towards your organization. And so the organization that you've now created, um, which is called One Million Orphans, and it's an incredible mission where you are striving to provide the resources for orphans around the world in poverty-stricken areas that really have a very slim chance for a better future if, if it weren't for these opportunities provided to them, right? And so I wanted you, um, I wanted us to talk about your organization and as well as that, kind of initially present your initial inspiration to uh, create this organization because you have experience in the adoption field, right? So you were a specialist in international adoption. Um, and what was it that you noted was a problem with the current situation um, of international adoption that may have played a factor in, in as well as starting your uh, organization? So it really like it was, uh, um, I think around 2018, um, actually 2014, we started seeing a decline in uh, adoptions, international adoptions, especially. I mean, there's like so many children, the millions, millions of children in the world, orphans uh, in the world. And so once I saw the, the decline in how many countries, for various reasons, obviously, barring the, you know, international adoption, I saw the need to do something on a local level. Mm -hmm. From the beginning, reading children's files, to matching them with the, you know, their families, to advocating for them. Uh, even here in our country, uh, I worked in a foster care system as well. And so reading files and being able to really find families for these children, it's, there's no gift that anybody can give. Uh, and I think because sometimes we, uh, we wish for things that we don't have. For me, I feel like not having a family is just like, it's terrible on a higher level, um, that sense of like belonging. And so I feel like uh, to give a child a gift of a family, a forever family is so very, very important. So I came up with one million orphans because, you know, there was one million people uh, who lost their lives uh, in Rwanda. So the title one million orphans is really touched to those lives that we lost, uh, innocent lives we lost in Rwanda to helping 
praying to be able to help uh, at least one million children. And uh, we're learning about farms to raise fish and to maybe uh, even like have a create uh, ways to have honey to create these sustainable resources for these mm-hmm. kids. And also really introduce to them, I feel like uh, I also want to feed their souls. I feel like I am a Christian and you know, we want to be able to minister to those kids, to tell them that you are loved uh, and keep them in schools feed them, provide for their medical needs. But, you know, we cannot do this by ourselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, And as you said, Lori, some of the proceeds from the book goes to those needs. And also people can donate as well to the one million orphans because we want everybody to be the heroes uh, in these children's uh, lives. Often, you know, before coronavirus, you buy a pizza for 20 bucks, that can actually buy a uniform for a child that will last them for almost like two semesters. That's a year. For wow. some, uh, so simple things for people are willing to give like five bucks, you're the hero of that child. And again, we cannot possibly do it by ourselves. My husband and I, mm-hmm. we're learning ways and we're partnering with people who can really uh, support these children because the, the need is so great. Mm-hmm. And where is it right now that you guys have established um, the volunteers or the, the help on the ground? Um, in what countries have you been able to establish so far? Because I know you guys are still a fledgling organization. Um, right. And so we want to be able to support our local organizations. And so, um, so far, where is the extent of your support? So really, like here in, in Burundi and Rwanda, we have kids also uh, we're thinking so one million orphan is everywhere. It's uh, all over the world. Uh, but for now, we focus in, in, in Rwanda and Burundi. Haiti was another country that I wanted to kind of give into just because of uh, they were trying to teach uh, social workers how to go in and help these kids. The Philippines, Bulgaria, in, in all those countries, I do have contact with the children's ministry there. But we really don't have that much resources to give into those places that mm-hmm. are, you know, in my heart. So really, like globally, if God, you know, blesses us, mm-hmm. we'll be able to go in uh, Eastern Europe, South America, Africa, even here in our own country. Uh, last year, actually, I did uh, with my team. I'm also a foster and adopted student advisor as well at our college. Last year, we decided to give gifts to kids in our foster care system. And we had about 56 kids. Uh, we bought gifts. We, we really like coordinated with staff, professors, and everybody bought kids wrote gifts that they needed. Uh, and for the first time, some of these kids in our own foster care system here in Texas, kids received, you know, gifts. It, almost like everything they needed from uh, that list of things. And you could tell like the tears in the room. And, and that's what moves me. You give them a gift. We brought Santa Claus in a room. Imagine kids who are teenagers in the U.S. who have never seen Santa Claus. And it just uh, pulled me in tears because it's the first time they're receiving a gift for Christmas. And I'm just like, whoa, the joy on their faces told me that, you know, I need to do much more. So every year, it's not like uh, just overseas. We also want to support our children here uh, in foster care as well. And I think that's great because, you know, your organization and the, and the mission that you have is, is a global mission because there are kids everywhere and in, with lack of resources in poverty stricken areas that don't have access to those resources and they're dependent. They're dependent on a system that is completely out of their control. And so it's very important for people to, to acknowledge that and realize that and always be aware. Um, And so I just wanted to mention, so your, your organization one of the main uh, resources they provide is paying for school fees so that these children can have their education and providing health care, clothing, food, right? And you guys are working on establishing sustainable resources so that these kids can continue to to get resources on their own, like food. And um, hopefully they may make some money, right? Off of those resources. (laughs) And um, so what I wanted to ask you regarding those resources that you're providing, that support that your your organization is providing. Um, When it comes to the lack of those resources, how does this impede on an orphan's ability to get ahead in life? Oh my goodness, Lori. So when I, even like when I think of myself, uh, I cannot imagine what I would be if I didn't have, yes, I was, you know, going from one family to the next and being abused and all. uh, But if I didn't have that support 
these kids not having resources that they need, especially like education to empower them uh, through school and also to give them, you know, the medical needs, it puts them in a vulnerable situation. It really puts them in a place where either they become, you know, for young girls, uh, if they need like women material, the, you know, simple hygiene uh, and things like that. That's very important. Right. That's very important. Things like we don't even think of being here, having access to those things. They mean so much for those kids who are unable to uh, get access to them. And so many of them become prostitutes for the girls. The boys, uh, many of them become, they call them street kids, Mm. basically picking from the dumpsters. And so for somebody who grew up on the streets to really expect them to be a functioning member of a society it's a very small chance, you know. Um, and I remember when I was advocating for this uh, little boy, he was from um, the Philippines. I got the file, his file, uh, and I was reading his file, and he's, he was uh, a street kid. And JR is his name. He was a street kid, and everything he wanted was to go to school. Mm. And I just look back and go, that's what I wanted because he wants to be somebody. Uh, and so when we do these things to really give back to these children, we want to empower them to have a future that they can say they worked for. Uh, and not just to feed them because you can feed them every day. That's no problem. But if, how are they going to really turn this, what you give them to sustain their future, to also help their families if they have even like uh, families. Uh, there was also another little girl that I was uh, advocating for who had been sexually abused. And I remember having one of the the family that was about to adopt this little girl, bring her in to host her into the family. And they said to me, you know what, Jean, she's been sexually abused. She has gone through so much pain. She cannot be normal in our family. And I said, that's the whole point. You need to give her so much love that she, she can feel like she can trust you, that she feels loved, that she can actually feel like she, she belongs. Uh, you're giving her what she doesn't have. And of course, it, it takes a lot of time to, to convince somebody to adopt a child who has gone through so much pain. And I use my, my life as an example for those families because, you know, I'm not all doomed. I went through hell and back and I'm semi normal. <laughs> You are amazing. You know, Thank you. And you're the you're the perfect advocate for all of these orphans because you are in a position where you're able to put yourself in the shoes of of these orphans and and understand their needs and their desires and their wants and be able to advocate for them and communicate that with the people in their community so that they are provided mm-hmm. those things that they need because you are absolutely right and i can say this firsthand from other interviews that i do that when an individual when a youth is placed in a position where they cannot dream because they do not have the resources and the opportunities around them where they can feasibly think of what they can aspire to be in life that they will look for survival and survival is on the streets survival is exploitative measures that will place them in a position of constant oppression in their life. And so I fully, fully, fully commend what you're doing. And I want to know, I want you to share with us for everyone listening, um, how can people learn more about your organization, more about your book uh, and support the work that you are doing with 1 million orphans? Thank you so much, Lori. Uh, and I really appreciate you saying that um, because it's, uh, it's a really, it, it's all of us is a responsibility. Uh, you know, they say it takes a village to raise a child. Uh, we're given so much more. And if we can just give a little to lighten somebody else's life, uh, you give them hope and then they can become somebody greater. They can go out there and change somebody else's life and perception and perspective. Absolutely. And so you're giving a gift that is like everlasting life for all, you know, us and for the, our world. Um, so people can really learn about uh, our organization if they search for a voice in the darkness.org. Uh, and also want to remind people that 
yes, the book is available on Amazon. And Amazon has been great. But if you donate, if you purchase the book directly from our website, we're actually able to give more to those mm -hmm. orphanages because obviously um, the market out there, Amazon prints and ships and everything else. Uh, and so you, you don't get a whole lot from book purchase directly from Amazon. Yes. So they're a third party. So they definitely take proceeds from what you what you're selling the book for absolutely so if people really want to support uh our you know these children by buying a book go to a voice in the darkness.org if you want to donate there too uh, if you click on a charity one million orphans there's going to be like a donate little button there to donate and again it's just be the hero for these kids because i myself cannot claim the credit that i'm doing all by myself i cannot feed uh, and provide for uh, one million children mm -hmm. that needs love my husband used to go he's like oh my gosh that's almost like your entire paycheck you just donated and i'm like these two weeks i worked for orphans you know mm -hmm. um but it, it's just when you give uh, and you know you're giving them a gift that is a everlasting gift uh and for like you know for this uh, last christmas these kids would never, our kids here uh, in our foster care system here in Texas, will never forget this uh, 2019 Christmas. It was huge for them. And you have kids who have been in uh, foster care from age four to now with their teenagers, 14 years old. Uh, and it gets tougher even here in our, uh, in our country for children to be adopted. You know, the general policy is that when kids are uh, seven years old, they're actually considered, even international, they're considered as older kids. And they, they tag older kids. But I don't know any seven-year-old who can provide for themselves. Uh, and so that sort of like, you know, older child, it's harder for them to get an uh, adoptive family. And it's also even harder when they're boys. Uh, it's even worse when they have a uh, disability uh, because most people do, you know, they want to make a little, little girl, cute and small and baby, baby, where they can cuddle and feel like they can change this child. is kind of capture them at the very uh, young age where they can mold them and shape them. The truth is like some of these kids, all they want is just someone to love on them and give them a hug at nighttime and pack them in and, simple things, you know, that we take for granted. Thank you for that last message. Again, in order to donate to One Million Orphans or to purchase your book, please do so at www.avoiceinthedarkness.org. Um, I'll make sure to add that in the show notes. And if people wanted to reach out to you, is that okay for people to do so? Yes, please. And, you know, Laurie, so I, I tell people this, like a lot of people have like somebody else who does this for them. <laughs> I send my own messages and sometimes I post on my social medias, uh, both like the Facebook and Instagram. And I, I think I tend to forget Twitter, sorry, Twitter type. <laughs> I'm the same way. <laughs> yeah. And so when I do, and I have a three-year-old, uh, I have a regular job on top of being a, you know, a author and a public speaker. And so I've, I tend to forget to post on there. But if people really like, you know, if they post there, if they reach out to me in a message and messenger and so forth, or email, I respond. Uh, and so I'm running many things. If they don't see me posting twice a day, that's because I just... It's You're not a busy because woman. I'm a, I'm a busy mommy here. And I'm <laughs> working and trying to make sure that these kids like, get messages. Like, you know, like the other day I was like given, I got a phone call that our kids in Burundi are, you know, the, the baby babies are drinking water. Babies. There's oh. no milk. And so I'm, I'm trying to, you know, work and trying to bring a, a find ways to support so many grounds, you know, um, but yeah, people follow me, uh, love on me, love on these kids. Uh, and also I want to challenge all of your listeners, uh, Lori, to challenge yourself to forgive. Whether you're forgiving you know, yourself. And again, sometimes one of the hardest things, we might have done something to ourselves, uh, to our bodies or whatever it is, and we have a hard time forgiving ourselves. I want to challenge people to forgive as somebody who have harmed you because really like that unlocks your potential to be out there to live your life to just have access to just joy mm -hmm. uh and, and again uh when you forgive you're not giving anybody a pass you're giving yourself a pass to survive to live and to, to thrive mm. thank yeah, you for that's that. 
Thank you for that final message. And I wanted to also wrap up with a final message that I consider to be highly, highly important considering the time that we are in right now, we're in March. Um, and I know that the 26th anniversary for the Rwandan genocide is in April. And so it will be a time uh, where many are gonna be remembering and honoring those that lost their lives during those 100 days. And so I just wanted to say to you, Jean, that I hope that in this incredibly important and valuable period that you'll be enjoying a time with your family and surrounded by their love and reflecting on how far you've come and the absolutely incredible impact that you are leaving in your path. And so truly, truly thank you, John, for being here. I mean, it really means a lot to me and we covered so much and it's so important for people to hear this message today. Thank you so much, Lori. I cannot thank you enough for that. It's uh, April is tough for all of us, uh, for many survivors, but it, it's, uh, you're right. We just need to be surrounded by love. Uh, and I just want to thank you again for just giving me the space and time. And I want to thank your listeners who just like turn in and listen and go ahead and share away uh, Lori's message. You do such an amazing job with your interviews. I love how calm you are and just Thank um, you. It makes you feel like you just we've known you for so many years. So oh, thank you. come to Texas. I will love to come <laughs> to Texas as soon as all of this passes. I will. I will. We really will make an, a plan for me to come, and I'll get an Airbnb over there. And no, 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 we have a home. We have a home, so you come oh, home and I can. Yes. Oh, come yay. And stay with okay. Us. Thank you. Absolutely, oh. we would love to host you. Oh. You know. Yes, my son will give you a million hugs if you love hugs, Lori. So he's a, such a hugger no. as well. So oh. yeah, you get a lot of hugs. Thank you, Jean. And thank you so much, truly, for being here today. And everyone Sorry. else, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it and feel inspired and would like to be a part of the Relentless Minds community, you can join the movement for change on Instagram and Twitter. We would also love to know how your experience has been as a listener. If you haven't yet, please go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join us next week for another powerful story. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.